Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Well, that's a doozy of a parable, eh? The king, or lord, and his uh, slave or servant, uh, and the forgiveness of debt under the broad, the broad topic of forgiveness as followers of Jesus. Now, it would be good to remember that parables are not intended to convey a particular story with a particular outcome. Parables are intended to tweak our minds and our hearts so that we can think and conceivably act differently upon things, do something different other than what we've been accustomed to doing after we've encountered a parable, or do something with renewed commitment to it. Again, the intent of a parable is to stir up our hearts and our minds, not just lay down some dogma or doctrine of the church, but to really speak to us personally as followers of Jesus. I think because of a couple of things that have transpired in Matthew's Gospel in the last few weeks leading up to today's question by Peter to his Lord and Savior Jesus about, I mean, I mean, and kudos to Peter when he asks that question, do I need to forgive seven times, Lord? And Jesus says, well, Peter, <laughs> I uh, applaud your generous thought about forgiving seven times, but you've got to be ready to forgive 77 times. An abundant, extravagant expectation conveyed by Jesus to Peter. It's not just a, oh, gee, I forgive you, we're done, and we're out of here. It is really a life -off commitment as followers of Jesus to be ready to forgive each and every day of our lives. And this isn't just some situation where we might wander around and I forgive you, I forgive you, you forgive me. Um, these kind of one-way forgiving actions. Forgiveness is, is a two-way mutual experience. Because the person who is forgiven is um, sort of raised up and welcomed in the community. Um, but also the person who did the forgiving is renewing his or her role as a follower of Jesus in offering forgiveness um, in, um, in any number of situations. So we heard that rather abundant response of Jesus to Peter's question about how many times does a follower of Jesus need to forgive. Then we delve into that parable. Now, uh, three or four Sundays ago, we had Peter uh, help to define the Messiahship of Jesus as the Son of God. And by identifying Jesus in that way, when Jesus has posed the question of who do people say that I am, but then more specifically, who do you, my disciples, say that I am? And Peter replies, you are the Son of God. For which Jesus proclaims that on here, the rock, he will build his church. Now, here's Peter elevated as the rock of the church that is to be on one Sunday. And the following Sunday, Jesus is turning to Peter when Jesus has announced the need to go to Jerusalem where he will be put up on trial, hung on a cross unto death, and then resurrected again after that painful death. Peter can't process this, and Jesus has to say, Satan, get behind me. You are a stumbling block. So how in the world did Peter go from rock to stumbling block in that whatever period of time elapsed? It's hard to tell if you read the Bible passage closely whether it was a continuing flow of this conversation between Jesus and his disciples or if there had been a little more time um, that passed in there for Peter to not respond as he ought to have. When Peter was declared the rock by Jesus, 
Peter was able to transcend his humanness, to get outside of his own personal ego, to see and feel the presence of the divine Son of God standing before him. And in that transcendent action, Jesus acknowledges it and says, Peter, you are the rock on which I will build my church. The following Sunday, when Peter has that negative reaction to what Jesus says to him and his fellow disciples and gets called a stumbling block, Jesus says, you looked only at earthly things, Peter. You did not look at the divine and transcend to the divine presence in your life. Now, that same gospel passage went on to have Jesus, now that he's been identified as the Messiah by Peter and his fellow disciples, now Jesus goes on to address us as disciples and what it takes to be followers of Jesus which is for us to strive to transcend our humanness, to set aside our egos, check them at the door, if you will, in order to seek to encounter the divine in our lives. Now, corporate worship can be one place where a person can perhaps find that kind of release and encounter the divine. Certainly our divine music here at St. Barnabas is a very uplifting and transcendent experience on most occasions. Um, but then again, maybe it's um, swinging in a hammock at the beach or on a mountaintop um, where people are more able to transcend themselves, their human nature, and experience the divine. Now, those couple of gospel readings, these previous few Sundays, were you know, so it's specific conversations between Jesus and his disciples. Today, we've got the C word in here, the church, which in the Gospels is not a word you hear very often because these Gospels were written um, before the church as we think of it, even historically, had really begun to emerge. So when in Matthew's Gospel, the church is mentioned a couple of times. That's a couple times more than it appears in the other three Gospels. And so it would appear that Matthew's community, the community in which he wrote with others, presumably, this Gospel about the life of Jesus, there was a further connection among the people who would hear this initially and then who heard it as the good news of the life of Jesus spread around the globe, but we can add that layer of community that is the church to today's passage about forgiveness and that parable of the king and the servants. Now, I mentioned the abundance of Jesus' response to Peter about how many times we've got to be ready to forgive, 77 times, which simply really means any minute and every minute, we've got to be ready to fall on our knees and beg for forgiveness ourselves or give forgiveness to others. At the very beginning of this parable, we get another example of God's abundant presence in our lives. God is there in Jesus and the Holy Spirit as God's self to forgive us, to offer us God's abundant love and mercy um, and justice. And so at the beginning of this parable, we hear that the slave who was called before the king owed him 10,000 talents. Now, I'm no specialist in the culture of the time, but my lay understanding is that 10,000 talents was like the GDP of a country at that time. It was a big, big number. This guy owed the king a lot of dough. And what does the king lord do? He forgives that huge debt of this individual, forgives him and sends him on his way. And then what's the servant do? But, I mean, he's not even out of the palace or wherever he met with the Lord. 
he sees another servant who owes him a hundred denarii, which again, in trying to understand the customs of the time, I gather a hundred denarii was like chunk change. But that servant could probably have earned back that hundred denarii in an afternoon's time and given it to him. But no, he makes that deal. Please forgive me, I'll pay you back. But the servant who just had been forgiven a huge debt doesn't. He turns around and harangues his fellow servant and ultimately gets him thrown in prison for this pittance of a debt, which again would probably have been repaid to him pretty darn quick if he had simply um, honored his fellow servant to let him get about his work and pay back his debt. Then, and I think this is to the credit of the other servants in this town or wherever the, uh, wherever the uh, parable takes place, they catch wind of what these, what's just happened between these two servants. And they presumably felt pretty badly about the servant who was treated so poorly by the other servant who just had been forgiven a huge debt by the Lord. And they go to seek out the Lord. They, they want to seek justice on behalf of their fellow servant. And what does the king or Lord do? But um, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. Cue Jesus' final verse. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. It seems to me that that final verse is intended to stand alone. That I don't believe we're invited to imagine the Lord as God, the Father of Jesus, but just a character in this parable that hopefully can tweak our hearts and minds to rethink um, how we forgive one another in our ongoing lives as we are called to do by our Lord and Savior. Therefore, what Jesus says in that final verse, so my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. It seems to be an emphasis on not so much the possibility of a final judgment being rendered on each and every one of us by God, but rather Jesus emphasizing the expectations that God has on each and every one of us about the moral seriousness of our human decisions. That God is counting on us each and every day to be really, really serious about the human decisions we make in which we are hopefully, as followers of Jesus, striving to transcend our humanness and do the right moral, ethical, social, and justice thing in leading our lives. Now, I was, had the pleasure of participating in the first meeting after Labor Day of the first uh, Selectman's Diversity Advisory Committee, which I uh, sit on, uh, sort of wearing a Greenwich Fellowship of Clergy hat. Um, it's a great group of people. It's uh, public school folks, uh, private school folks, uh, Department of Human Services. Um, Fred Camillo sat in for a good chunk of the meeting. And it was really neat to hear, especially from the people involved with schools, um, about children starting to return from little, you know, pre-K age kids right through Greenwich High School. And to hear um, people acknowledge the terribly challenging times that we're living in. Uh, um, as if the pandemic's not bad enough, well, politics is pretty ugly too. Uh, the economy's not doing so great. So people acknowledge all of these things going on in all of our lives 
put it in the context of the town of Greenwich, and it was really neat to hear the educators share how young people coming back to school are being invited to be kind, to listen to everybody, to give everyone their space, uh, to try to be open-hearted and open-minded about coming together in these school settings, and it really prompted this group to say, gee, what in the world could we do to invite the town of Greenwich, um, especially the older generations, the parents and others, to be like-minded and make a commitment here in this new season, even if we don't know what the new normal is precisely looking like, but at least, as Jesus would probably appreciate, let's try to be childlike and take the lead or follow the lead of what children are doing in schools all around town, which is to renew our commitment to be kind and forgiving and generous to one another going forward. And that was a really reassuring thing to have happen in a practical way. Uh, but I think it particularly can pertain to this gospel passage that we heard this morning as this particular part of the body of Christ. It is my fervent prayer that we might take to part and time to be reminded to forgive 77 times day in and day out. Be mindful of what meaning that has in a faith community that is in the town of Greenwich and put our best feet forward all together to see us through to the new normal, come what may. Amen.